Okay, welcome everyone to our uh, empathy circle. We're doing an empathy circle on the topic of what does reason feel like or whatever is alive for you. Uh, we're just going to go around and start with uh, introductions. Maybe I'll just start with that. I'm Edwin Rutsch, director of the Center for Building a Culture of Empathy, and been working for quite a while on how do we create a more empathic society. And uh, one of the methods we use is this empathy circle process. So. Uh, so we're going to be doing that and uh, for the next two hours. So we're just going to go around and introduce ourselves. John, do you want to just? Thank you, everyone. It's a, pleasure to be, it's a pleasure to be here again. Um, so I'm John Verveke. I'm an associate professor of cognitive psychology and cognitive science at the University of Toronto. I also um, am the author of a bunch of series, uh, perhaps the one you might have seen as Awakening for the Meaning Crisis. And I do a lot of work around building ecologies of practices, generating the relevant and supportive cognitive scientific theory, and also doing community building and the building networks of communities. And, um, and Nathan is helping me with that. Um, and so I'm glad to, to be here with him. Oh, great, thanks. Uh, Cheryl, would you like to go next? Hi, um, my name is Cheryl Hsu and I'm thrilled to be here at my first ever empathy circle. Empathy and reason are both subject matters that are near and dear to the heart. Um, my, I come from a background as a systemic designer. So I um, did a master's degree in strategic foresight and innovation and have been doing a lot of work around bringing together different stakeholders across social systems, healthcare, food systems, uh, health, uh, housing as well. And about a year and a half ago, um, really had a moment of needing to question all of the approaches and methodologies and paradigms with which we were seeking solutions to the problems that we were facing. So since then, I've been somewhat on an independent research journey um, on something I've been calling a soul directed masters and really looking at what does it mean for us to design with mystery. Hey, well, thank you. Uh, Nathan? Yeah, um, I'm Nathan Vanderpool. I'm based in Berlin. I am uh, have a lot of different academic backgrounds, but currently I'm uh, working uh, with John and trying to put together a network uh, called Respond. And we're working on this project uh, of which Edwin is also a part. And um, yeah, um, that's maybe I could say some more or we could just jump in. Yeah, within the empathy circle, we'll be able to talk about all that. So I want to get into it as soon as, as, soon as possible. So yeah, so I just may give a quick uh, intro how the Empathy Circle works. For anyone that's watching this, you can go to empathycircle.com and there's an extensive uh, explanation of how the process works. But uh, this, uh, what we're, we do in the Empathy Circle is one person is the speaker and then one person is an active listener and the other participants are silent listeners. So one person will be the speaker, they'll select who they speak to, You'll speak on the topic, you know, share an idea or two, and then pause and let the uh, listener reflect back their understanding in your own words, what you heard the speaker say. And the goal is for the speaker to feel heard to their satisfaction. Like if the person reflects back and they didn't quite get what you were trying to convey, you can say it again, say it maybe in other words, but if they did get it, then you just continue with your uh, train of thought. And we do timed turn taking and we'll start with the five minute turns and uh, I'll keep time here. And if the if it comes up to five minutes, I'll just kind of slowly ease this <laughs> up here. <I'm, laughs> so just to let you know, and at that point, you kind of wrap up what you're saying, you know, in a, in a, in a sentence or two, get your final reflection from, from your listener and then as the uh, listener, you will then be able to speak some, to, to select someone to speak to, and then we continue with the process. We're just gonna do the full time. We'll have like five or 10 minutes at the end, just to sort of debrief, have an open debrief, uh, uh, you know, just about how, how was the experience. The one thing is, is 
as the speaker, you want to pause periodically so the listener has a chance to reflect. And if you and you're only reflecting your understanding of what the speaker says. And uh, if the speaker is going on and on, and you think, oh, I'm never going to remember all this, you're already starting to lose some of the stuff that they're talking about. You can say, oh, can you just pause so I can reflect back uh, what I'm hearing you say? And sometimes as a facilitator, I might hold up this sign, remember to pause. <laughs> <laughs> because people go on and on. That's one of the hardest things. So we want to get right into it so we have the maximum amount of time for, for doing the uh, process. And uh, so the question is, is what does reason feel like and uh, or whatever is alive for you? If there's something, you know, kind of really burning in your awareness, you can uh, talk about that. And just to model it, I'll be the first listener just to model how the how the process, uh, the reflection works. So whoever would like to start, let's get started. What does reason feel like or whatever is alive for you? And I'm listening. Well, maybe I'll go first, since this is a question I'm frequently raising. Um, and I think Edwin actually posed this question in response to some of my work. And so the first thing I'm going to say is I'm just appreciative of that. Um, so what, what, what's happening for me right now is I'm feeling um, initially overwhelmed by the question because I do a lot of work on it. And so I'm trying to think about uh, perhaps selecting as quickly as possible what's most relevant. Um, and for me, uh, what reason feels like is that I get a sense of being in contact with how things are opening up to me uh, very, uh, both very clearly, uh, but also very, uh, also very evocatively. So okay, can I reflect that back what I'm yeah. hearing? So yeah. I'm hearing that you're appreciative for, for this topic because it's a topic that you really work on. It's really kind of salient to you. And you're thinking, okay, what is there's it's a, it's a big topic, you know, what's the most uh, important aspect of it? And it's the, and you're saying number one is the, the opening up sort of, of mm -hmm. uh, there's this opening up that's, that, that is happening. That's yes, yes, I feel heard. Um, and that opening up has this very interesting feature to it. Um, it has an aspect in which I feel like I'm both correcting myself and transcending myself. Um, and so it sort of reaches back to what I've thought and reaches forward to what I haven't thought in a way in which both of those are sort of affording and opening each other up. So there's a real sense of opening, but the quality of the opening is you're moving forward and also moving backwards uh, in sensing what you've said. I'm not quite sure what, what that is, but there's a, a forward and a sort of a backward feeling. Yeah, yes. There's a sense of um, something almost like dialogue uh, when reason is uh, going forward. So for me, when it takes on a life of its own and it feels that it's coming more from the world than from me, that's when I feel uh, that I'm, uh, that's what reason feels like to me. Okay, so reason feels like it's, uh, it's like an inner dialogue. Uh, if, if the, no, uh, no, no, okay. no, it's, it's, it's more, um, it's, not, it's not within me. That's uh, actually what I'm trying to emphasize. Oh, it's actually uh -huh. between me and the world and it's a sense of reciprocity the world is disclosing itself and also my mind is reshaping itself to conform and those are are reflecting and driving and affording each other did that work better yeah so it, it's a dialogue between you and the world you're you're hearing the world and reflecting the world and sort of integrating or relating with with the world yeah, it's that, and it, it has a combination of sort of the two senses of realization. The two, we have two senses. We have a sense of when things are confirming, that's what makes them real. And we also have a sense of when we're surprised by what we didn't expect, that's also what's real. Um, and when you get those two moments together, like the world is opening up and it, there's a surprising aspect, but it's also coming into an order. It's very beautiful in that way. It's very beautiful in that way. So this process has a, a beauty to it. There's a sort of an opening up and there's a, um, 
there's a sense of surprise, a feeling of surprise and of, uh, and of an ordering, sort of a sense yes. of ordering. Yes, yes. Yeah, that was very well said. Yeah, you, I feel very hurt. Um, and so for me, that I call that the logos. That's when it takes on this life of its own. And when I feel caught up in the logos, either when I'm interacting with myself or especially when I'm interacting with others, that's what reason primarily feels to me. When I feel like I'm not making it, I'm neither discovering it nor making it. I'm I'm being caught up in it and participating mm -hmm. in it. So there's this under, you're not making it, you're just letting it sort of flow, just arise. Uh, it's like not out of your control. It's sort of like just being part of nature yeah. or something or I don't know. But, but not passive. It's not passive mm -hmm. either. Mm. It, it's, um, if this isn't too graphic, uh, I mean, it, this is an ancient metaphor. It's like making love to somebody. You're not passive. And you're not just making it happening. Right? You're, there's this there's this reciprocal opening and participation, and you have to be willing to be sensitive to the course it's going to take for itself. It has a life of its own that you have to respect. Mm -hmm. So it's like making love, where you're you're interrelate you're relating with someone. It has a life of its own. It's like you're not controlling it, but you're following the the unraveling or the flow of it. Yeah, yeah, that was that's great time too. So yeah, okay. I feel very well heard, Evan. Okay, and I'll speak to Nathan. Sure. Uh, since we just did an empathy circle yesterday, so this will you already know a little bit of how to do this. So um, it seems to me that there's like different f forms, different types of reasoning. It's like usually reason is seen as like uh, when I hear about it in society, it's like there's this one reason. But it seems to me that there's a lot of reasons or reasoning uh, that it's not just one form. So what I hear you saying is like, there's a diversity here that you think sometimes gets covered over by people using the same word to mean different things. Yeah, it's like the uh, reasoning of a debate, right? It's like, how can I win? How can I dominate the other person that has this feeling of control? And sort of like, how can I really feel that that sense of ah, I, I won? <laughs> right? I dominated them. I, I won this. And there's that satisfaction of, of that domination. Uh, so that seems to be sort of one form of, of uh, reason. Mm. So I hear you saying like there's a flavor that has like a competitive aspect to it and try to trying to establish what's right over against somebody else who's arguing something else. And then there's a, another form. I think actually what we're doing here, I think empathy, you know, this, the empathy circle is another form of reason because we're, we're focusing on the listening. It's like there's a, it doesn't feel maybe as competitive, you know, it's, it's like, there's really a focus on, you know, you're hearing me and I know you're hearing me. And for me, that creates a sense of calm that, oh, I don't have to compete and get all anxious about, am I gonna be heard or not in this conversation? Okay, so in contrast to this like competitive style of reasoning with each other, we can also get into a more collaborative, more open, spacious, uh, sort of listening to each other and that creates a maybe more open sense in your body makes you helps you to relax yeah and uh, the other is another form of reason is I read a lot of academic papers on empathy and it's like my head hurts <laughs> reading those academic papers everything's so tight and constrained and controlled and it, it's yeah there's sort of that form of reasoning too it's just like very sort of heavy constricted uh, yeah form so what I hear you saying is like when it gets really heady and theoretical and maybe even like complex and precise in this sort of systematic way, that this is a way of reasoning that also like for you actually kind of feels more contracted in your body. And there's there's another reason. It seems like the reasoning is seen as almost like a supernatural force, like God. And it's like outside of the body uh, type of a reason, like an understanding of, of reasoning. But even that, con even that has a feeling to it. It, it, and it's hard to. I feel like I don't have the vocabulary to describe it. You know, there's there's all these subtle feelings. I just don't have the vocabulary of describing the felt experience of it. So it's it's, it's like uh, the sort of the reasoning of the cosmos in a way, like the the, the sort of godlike divine reason that might ex exist somewhere outside of you and. You feel it, but you don't have the words to describe it exactly. No, there's more of the reasoning. That's that's how it's sold, like through ah. uh, enlightenment reasoning, right? It's, 
it seems like enlightenment reasoning was replacing God as a supernatural force with this reasoning, which is this supernatural force that is just sort of beyond our experience. It's just out there somewhere. And, and uh, yeah, so that, that, at least that's, yeah, that's something that comes up for me. Okay. So like a fourth kind of reasoning that kind of exists independent of you and just out there in the world somewhere. Yeah, it seems like kind of a con job. <laughs> It feels like a way of controlling people, you know, so yeah, so I kind of feel a little resentment or irritation, uh, you know, around that. It's about like, that uh, worldview, yeah. yeah, about that world. Yeah, that, the way yeah. that this can be used as a kind of like power tool or a form of control is, uh, is it like annoying or upsetting to you in some way? Yeah, yeah, I feel fully heard. Thanks. Oh, thanks. Okay, uh, I'll pick Cheryl. <laughs> Uh, to be my listener um yeah for me there i related a lot to um concepts that i've learned from like rob berbea about the energy body which is if in like lay terms would just be an imagination of your body as a field of energy and then this contraction and opening um really represents it to me like when i feel like i'm uh able to stay with my body able to stay with my experience of the world. Um, and I feel like sort of open, like a, a sort of a, a free floating kind of almost like forward feeling to it, like a leaning forward feeling in it. Um, this is, I feel this when I'm engaged in what I would call reason, uh, which I can maybe go into a little bit more. Um, in contrast, like when I feel this sort of constriction and contraction of my body, it's often that I, I'm, I find I may not even realize it at the time, but I, and sometimes I do, I, but I'm failing to reason. When I realize it at the time, I'm, I feel maybe stuck in this contraction. Um, I, I'm stuck in a story, a view, a way of things are that seems really like solid and hard to break out of. Thank you. Uh, what I'm hearing is there are times where there is a kind of gravitational center you're able to be embodied and be very much from that place then expansive and to feel into the world and worlds around you. And that might be actually the place from which you're expanding, but then contraction on the other hand, the way you were describing it seemed to me like you're scattered off and trying to grasp. Hmm. Yeah, and sometimes with that trying to grasp, it's almost like the the worst form of it is when I am grasping like quite tightly and feel that I have the view. Um, either then I might argue in a more sort of uh, my view versus your view kind of way and trying to prove my view, or I might just be unable to be creative and, and think in a different way than I currently do. Yeah, so I think from that I'm hearing that in that way that you're actually to some extent like trapped or clinging to a particular way of seeing the world and you can't see that you are clinging it so you're operating inside of that which you are trapped in and trying to move out from there yeah i think that's right and even sometimes i find myself i even develop a sort of meta awareness and then I, I can take steps, maybe take a walk, do something to like sort of break this solidity. But I, uh, yeah, sometimes I'm even aware that I'm in this contracted state and holding tightly to a view. Um, and in that state, kind of for me, unable to reason or feel disconnected from it. So with that, um, I noticed that almost the trappedness has both a cognitive kind of mental quality to it. Um, but also an embodied quality to it. Like you actually feel physically trapped as well. And that's why these experience of, experiences of being able to disrupt that cage and step out, move into a different space, essentially shift your perspective physically is a way to start to also kind of connect the mind stuckness and the body stuckness. Yeah, yeah, I feel fully heard. Thanks, Cheryl.
And I, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll go next and speak to, speak to, actually at this point, are we going in the same? You can speak to anyone you want. You John want. hasn't listened yet, so you could choose him, but it's your choice. Do whatever you wish. Okay, I choose John. <laughs> I choose you. Ah. What does reason feel like? Yeah, I, I want to follow Nathan's picking up of when reason feels really good in the body and when reason feels very contracted in the body. And maybe I'll start with when reason actually feels very good, when I feel pleasure in reason. And I find that often there's a quality of flow in architecture. Like it's like there is this feeling of I, I am a designer and, many, and in many ways a builder by nature. And when reason feels really good in my body and my mind and it's connected, it feels like if I'm kind of physically enacting it, it's like I know where to pull different ideas and concepts and different levers to be able to start to shape a larger whole that I might be intuiting, but not, but it's still often like dimly beneath that horizon of awareness. And when reason feels good in my body, it feels like it's actually in service of kind of scaffolding that journey towards that kind of wholeness and harmony. So what I hear you saying is that you wanna talk first about when reason feels good uh, in your body um, and you were talking about there's something like a flow that you get right, where you're, you're putting the pieces together and they're fitting together and you find yourself in service of that whole that is taking shape. So heard. Yeah, and I, when reason doesn't feel so good in my body, and this probably comes from also stories that I hear mirrored in somewhat of what Edwin has described. I think it's when I'm grasping at a preconception of what reason is supposed to be in the first place. Mm. And, and then kind of my ego comes, it's like my ego comes into play and it becomes about my intelligence and my skillfulness in being able to kind of live up to, to meet reason's standards. And I don't really, I notice it comes up, um, especially when I'm caught up in debate, when I'm caught up in this competitive mode of reasoning often with others where there's this kind of adversarial, it's not even always explicitly adversarial, but often there is this feeling of who's getting there first. And even that very idea that there is like a getting there first for me begins to, yeah, like I think clench the very openness that often like is the good feeling of reason, that flow state, that wideness and expansiveness. So what I hear you saying is that when reason feels uncomfortable in your body is uh, when you are in the grip of a certain preconception of what reason is, you feel like you're trying to meet a standard and then this engages you sort of egotistically, uh, you meeting that standard is a way of sort of, uh, I, you didn't quite say this, but maybe like winning in an adversarial kind of debate situation. And so uh, that it turns into that kind of mode. 
Yeah. And it's that, that feels right. And as you're mirroring that back, I feel like there is um, like something that's showing up right now is I often think about reason as being in service to a specific outcome. And I'm realizing here that that deeper kind of like harmonious feeling of reason, it's actually in service to beauty. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and yeah, there's, there's certainly different forms of reason that one can kind of pick up as different tools in the toolkit. More and more, I find myself longing for surrendering to that higher form of reason, the harmonious reason. So you've had a realization in this practice um, that you had previously thought of reason as directed towards specific goals or outcomes, but now you're getting a deeper sense of reason that is oriented towards beauty. And you're also realizing that you would like to pursue this more in your life. Hopefully. Do you have any, do you have any one final things you wanted to say or do you feel heard? Yes, I feel heard. Thank you. Great. Okay, I, I'll speak to Nathan. And I wanted to really pick up on what uh, Cheryl said. Um, because part of what reason feels like to me is a caring. Uh, yes, it's a, it's a shaping. And it's a being shaped, but it's also a caring, uh, a caring about what's true, what's good, what's beautiful. Yeah, so what I hear you saying is that it's like a reason as well as being uh, participatory in nature is also about sort of caring about things. Yes, it, it's, it, it's a, it's a, and it's, it's a, it, it's a careful way of caring. <laughs> what I mean by that is it's, learning how to care appropriately for things, to pay attention to them appropriately, to respond to them appropriately, to shape them and be shaped by them appropriately. So what he's saying is like, it's a kind of skillful way of caring, like not just caring in a, in a random way for whatever is coming up, but like actually sort of having some kind of agency and doing it well. Exactly, I feel well heard. Um, it's very much in that sense, like love, um, in that you are very careful in your caring about, uh, uh, disclosing what's true or, or shining forth what's beautiful or making possible what's good. Yeah. So what I hear you saying is it's in some ways, like trying to afford the, the good and the true and the beautiful um through like paying careful attention to it yeah careful attention and and also um the courage of commitment uh, right um, but also the willingness to receive and uh, uh, right receive insight receive responses from right uh to indwell and to be indwelt i guess is what, what i'm saying and to, to learn how to do that and well Hmm. So what I hear is like to kind of participate in a, almost like a conversational way um, with my personhood almost, like yes. to, to sort of put that into the play and allow, my, allow myself to change what's happening and to shape it, but also to be changed by it and to allow it to shape me. Yes, I feel well heard, except perhaps that I'm trying to emphasize that there's an important element of virtue here, like, like there's, a, there's a commitment to behaving um, in, in the best possible way, virtue, virtuosity and power, right? Like, like um, maturing your ability to care, like we, when we care about another person, also maturing our ability to care about the true, the good and the beautiful. Yeah, so what I hear you saying is that in some ways, like there's an aspect of really giving yourself over to this practice that you dedicate yourself almost uh maybe well I, I don't know if you'd say it's too far in a sense of like almost as a 
as a as a dedication a a, a, a worshiping almost but like a, a participating in a in a kind of like holy enterprise of of giving my best to uh, try to develop it. That's good. Um, I feel heard. I guess I want to develop that then and say, yeah, it's it's there's an important aspect of reverence and devotion and also aspiration, uh, all bound up together. Um, in, in in what I'm trying to put my finger on. And so I hear you saying there's like a kind of moving toward the highest, the, the better, the best version of myself, uh, the best version of the world and trying to like really commit to, to moving toward, to moving the, the developing sort of self world toward that, that which is good. Yes, I feel heard. For me, it's that, it's that how the care translates into commitment and then how the commitment translates into character. That's what, that, that, there's sort of these, there's the here now, of caring, and then there's the more long-term commitment, and then there's the deep of cultivating character. So it's like, in some ways, by practicing this caring about what's good right now um, and committing to doing that over time, I'm developing myself into someone who can just naturally understand what is good to care about right now. Yeah, I feel very well heard by that, Nathan. That was excellent. You said it better than I did, in fact. Um, so <laughs> um, I appreciate that. Yeah, and so I I find what I'm talking about now, I think resonant with what everybody, everybody else is talking about, about trying to get away, as Edwin said, from this narrow sort of logic-centric notion of reason into this more comprehensive cultivation of wisdom sense of reason, if I can put it that way. Mm, yeah, so moving away from a kind of like logic bound debate oriented winner, winner version yeah. of reasoning toward a more like this cultivation of the good and in wisdom as a sort of way to know how to, how to approach things. That was excellent. I feel very well heard. Thank you, Nathan. Sure. Um, I'll pick Edwin to, to listen to me. Um, yeah. So what's coming up for me is a kind of experiential version of this, like when I, especially in reasoning with others, when I feel that I'm in that space of reason, I feel like we're at the edge, where somehow there's this, this feeling in my body of being on a precipice of the known and looking together. Mm -hmm. So the aspect of reason for you is uh, being on an on an edge and with others and looking and seeing what's uh, beyond that that edge. Yeah, and it's kind of almost like um, there's like a an aliveness to the to the atmosphere um, outside of me, there seems like we're, we're sensing into where we have like sort of an inkling that we're following, but we, we don't know where we're going, but we're sensing into it. Uh, and it's, it's almost like there's a sort of combination of like electricity, but also a very, very calm feeling in the air. So you're at that precipice with others feeling there's a sense of calmness, but, a sense of expectation and, and excitement, sort of an electricity of maybe what will, what will arise. Yeah. Yeah. And in that state, which, um, you know, it's, it's not, uh, it's not a very common thing. Like I think, especially when it's in its real, in this pure form that I've experienced it sometimes, um, it's not something that I run across frequently, but, um, it does feel as though I'm just so deeply engaged in, uh, the present moment. This, I guess, maybe this is in, in, in John's schema. I'm, I'm really engaged in the present moment, and perhaps that oh, with that commitment over time and the and the the eventual sort of development of a character that will do, can do this. Um, maybe that's where it's pointed. But my my experience of that present moment is one that yeah, it's very connecting. It feels like I am very deeply with others, and um, also has a kind of childlike playfulness to it in my experience that there's a, a way like when I would be a child on a playground and just just playing like no reflection about what I'm doing so there's a, a real sense of presence in that moment as well as a, 
a feeling of connectedness with, with others. And there's a, a playfulness and a childlike quality uh, to that feeling. Yeah. Yeah, this is one of these like um, sort of with others. And the other one that strikes me is when I'm in a place, uh, especially of conflict, and I can open myself to a perspective that's not my own and really see the truth of a critique that I'm being delivered, like some feedback that I'm getting. Um, it also feels then as though there's just sort of more than I, like I'm, I'm in touch with more than I can see. Um, and I'm opening to it and I'm allowing it to come into me and I'm allowing myself to like, let go and really sense in again, of like what is here that I might be bullshitting myself about right now. So there's a, a quality like when you're in conflict uh, with, I guess, with someone with someone else that you can open yourself and sense into sort of what's b beyond that and uh, beyond the conflict. Uh, and there's also a, a sense of your own self-awareness, uh, like sort of a questioning of what, how, how might you be bullshitting yourself somehow? Yeah, yeah. So in this sense, it contrasts to the first one where like I can be in this full presence and I'm not aware of my own uh, way of looking in a way. I'm just like present mm -hmm. with that. And this other way, uh, I'm actually quite intentionally um, drawing up my own way of looking and, and someone else's and then trying to step back from both and really see it anew in some way, like what is here and what, what, what other aspects of reality am I not seeing? Okay. So you're, you're sensing into the other person, but you're also sensing into your own experience and have that question of what, what am I missing here? What, if, what am I not seeing in myself? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's right. I feel fully heard. Oh, okay. Then uh, I'll speak to Cheryl. Um, Wow, that's great. Love, love these, love, love these, this, these uh, insights here. This is, uh, yeah, really enjoying getting a lot out of that, being in that, having that awareness. I'll pause there. And I'm hearing enjoyment of the dialogue and listening that we've been engaging in so far. Yeah, and one thing is there's a multiple, there's various terms. There's like reason, you know, reasoning, uh, cog cognition, and uh, body and mind. So there's sort of these terms that I'm sort of wondering about. Like, like I, I know that you, you had said something. Oh, I have my my body and my mind. So sort of that duality uh, aspect of it. And it does seem to me that when we go into when I go into my mind, there's a felt experience in my mind. If if I if I'm if my awareness goes into the kind of the head area of, of my body. I'm hearing um, just this noticing of how these different words that we're using and what they evoke are also located in different parts of the body, especially around the head. Yeah, and, and I wonder if reason is the, the movement of one feeling into another, the, the flow. Like if I just sit in my head, like I, I feel some con, sort of constriction, you know, I feel some kind of a focus, you know, maybe some responsibility to make sure all the timing and everything's, you know, working right here, keeping track of everything. So there's a, a sense of of constriction that I'm feeling in, in, in sort of this part of my body. And by just sharing that feeling with you, it's like I'm bringing sort of awareness to that feeling and it's sort of shifting. It, it's got a little bit more spaciousness and it's, and it's kind of brought me into a little bit of a feeling of anxiety, like in, in this sort of part of my body. So I shifted from this awareness of what's going on here, shared it with you, and then another feeling sort of arose. And I'm wondering, is that reason is like moving from one state to the other? Is that what reason is? You know, so, yeah, I just kind of, just kind of a sense sitting with a curiosity about that. Mm. Yeah, so what I'm, what I'm receiving is There is something about the quality of awareness and attention when 
you name like when like you name something. So perhaps you name like a felt sense or something, a sensation in the body as a particular, you give it a name yeah. and the moment yeah. of its naming, there's some kind of movement or shift that happens. And what I'm hearing is that reason might be the, like it's like the intentionality of that awareness to move yeah, there's no intentionality. It's like it does it without me doing anything. It's just by me sharing it with you, you hearing it, I, I'm, I change. Maybe it's not what John is talking about, like that indwelling, right, in others. So I feel you indwelling in me. So I, I'm feeling that energy from you coming into me and really trying to hear and understand where I am. And that's mm -hmm. sort of shifting, something's shifting in me in, in, in just sharing that and, and, you, and you trying to understand it or try, try to reflect it back. Yeah, so there's a quality of something that's ever shifting and fluid and in movement. So even in the moments where you momentarily grasp it, it's already become something else. So how are you moving? With yeah, that. and I'm wondering, is reason that movement from one state to the other? It, I, you know, I'm not, I'm, I guess I'm trying to put my finger, I can put my finger on my glasses and say, this is the glasses, you know, this is my nose. Can I put my finger on the reason? And, and I'm wondering if that is the, what reason is. But probably not, but maybe I'm totally wrong here. But that's just something I'm thinking about. I, there is this... Um desire to be able to like pin down reason yeah, yeah. and locate it. Um, but it seems like there's also an elusive quality to it too, where it's like the moment you do. Yeah, something. I guess I'm looking to others like, hey, is this what you're meaning by reason? I'm kind of looking for some kind of a shared understanding. Like, are we, are we talking about the same thing here? Is this what you're meaning by reason? Uh, so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I think um, what I'm hearing too is this desire for levers, like it's like what we name together is levers yeah. that all of us can feel and touch together mm -hmm. so that mm -hmm. we sort of can co-navigate this mysterious territory that we're all gesturing towards. Yeah, I don't know if it's mysterious. I didn't think in sort of terms of mysterious. It's more out of sort of curiosity and sort of a desire for clarity, some sort of clarity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think I'm hearing this. This is, yeah, this desire for something to be able to be re revealed like and co-created as well yeah um, i think the word clarity is what i was looking for yeah so some kind of clarity <laughs> sense of clarity Clear. yeah yeah with that i feel heard yep thanks i'll choose nathan Yeah, something I, I really appreciate shifting towards um, is this movement towards collective reason or communal um, reasoning. And I think that really came up, especially um, both with Nathan and Edwin, when you were describing, like, I think Nathan, when you were describing like that, the electric quality of when a group of people, like for example, the four of us as well, can kind of hold that potential together. But there is this um, way in which reason becomes the scaffolding for us to co-build something that's revealing in the center. And I feel like there is, a, that quality feels simultaneously like revelatory, like it's something that has already been there and we're almost peeling back the layers to be able to see what is already present. 
And yet there's also something that's like intensely generative and creative. And we're bringing in reasoning and perspectives to be able to build that which is being revealed. What I hear you saying is like, you're really interested in or what's coming up for you is this group dynamic of like reasoning together, uh, both as a sort of process of discovering something uh, that we're sort of peeling back layers and layers of, but at the same time, feels like we're making as we discover. So it's like both generative and discovery. Yeah, yes. And um, I do appreciate now this bringing of reasoning into relationality and into um, into the connections that we're creating. Um, yeah, it's like the, the image that's coming up right now is almost each of us feeding threads to the center and we're co-weaving something that from our perspective, we can only from like, I guess like one perspective, you can only be able to grasp a small part of, but then, yeah, I, I feel like that kind of collective sense making is where reason more than anything becomes vital to be embodied because it's one thing for me to be reasoning in my, in my own psyche, for example. It's like, I have this capacity to kind of map out what makes sense to me in terms of what is meaningful or what I want to do or what I, how I feel moved. And then when I'm stepping into a space with all of you, I'm suddenly very aware of, oh, what, what is the thread that I'm feeding to the group so that I can kind of pull all of you in with me. And we are weaving something together. And I think that care becomes really important because it needs to land, it needs to connect, it needs to, whatever I'm naming needs to evoke something in you. So what I hear you saying is kind of a felt sense difference between reasoning on your own, in which it seems like you're getting just a kind of coherent picture of what's going on for you, and reasoning with others where you're much more tuned into caring about uh, something that's outside of any one of us, but that you're trying to sort of create with us. Yeah, I, I feel heard. And I think that's, it's helping me um, get more clarity also around, I think that desire that Edwin, you were invoking because there is something very mysterious about, or like there's something that feels almost um, slippery about words, I guess, like the words that we use around reason or cognition or mind or logic. It's like that territory is something that we're all kind of embodied in and feeling into. And then what we're really hoping to do is to be able to kind of build up connection by being able to almost turn, it's like turn that into material for us to co-generate with. Yeah, I'm noticing also kind of like finding trouble grasp, like it's, it's like hard. I'm, I'm noticing kind of uh, in my body right now, this like, oh, there's something elusive that keeps slipping away in the moment I'm trying to grasp it. So what I hear you saying is like, <clears throat> this kind of, these terms that surround reason is like in a semantic cloud um, are in some ways maybe like little blocks that we can use to sort of mark out the territory and, and connect to each other by caring about what, that, what that's like. And there's also um, some sense that something's there that you can't quite grasp and put clearly into words at the moment. Yeah, I feel, I feel fully heard. Thank you, Nathan. Sure.
I'll, I'll choose John. Um, yeah. So what's coming up for me is, um, in some sense, this reason in the body, the of um, the feeling of reason in the body as contraction versus openness, kind of takes on a different level. And it was interesting to me when you were speaking about it, Cheryl, kind of the, the idea of a collective body when we're reasoning with others, that um, in some sense, I might not be able to do a good job of reasoning on my own um, when I'm contracted. But if I'm in a group and I'm contracted um, and can hold it at least in somewhat of a skillful way, um, the relative openness of others and their ability to be creative and to not have this sort of collapse onto a view um, can actually sort of like aid me in also coming into reason. Um, so in some sense, I feel there's this uh, interesting idea of uh, what is the what is the collective feeling of reason in the body, collective body. So what I'm hearing you say, Nathan, is um, you were picking up from Cheryl um, the idea of a collective embodiment that in so, is in some relationship to your individual sense of embodiment, and that that collective embodiment uh, can often help you draw draw you out when you feel personally sort of contracted in your embodiment. Uh, and you think that ability to draw you out is an important feature of reason. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. And that's like also this, um, it opens up that question, a question for me, which is sort of how much can we really say that we can reason on our own? Um, is it like an inherent component of reason that I'm reasoning with others? I suppose like I can imagine doing it, but I can also imagine, uh, I mean, on my own, but I can also imagine a certain kind of deep delusion that I might fall into <laughs> if I only reason on my own. Um, and that it might just, I might just not notice that I'm caring about the wrong things uh, because no one's ever held up a sort of question to me, a question that maybe my own psychology is set up to not look at because I, I don't want to see that. <laughs> so you're raising, um, uh, um, you're, you're raising a question whether or not reason might be inherently sort of dialogical in nature uh, because although you can imagine yourself reasoning on your own, you suspect that you might not be able to catch the ways in which you're deluding yourself because you're, you might not be caring about the right things because you don't have the questions of others to get you to look at those other things. Is, is that? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's, that's right. And then in some sense, um, it's a kind of distributed cognition. Like, so mm -hmm. if, if reason is, uh, if reason is properly understood, something that kind of necessarily includes others, even if not always, but uh, inherently is sort of based on that or needs that as a component to really have it. Then there's a kind of yeah, distributed embodied cognition, something like this um, that's coming up for me. And I'm also quite curious about this, the mind body distinction that um, got drawn out a little bit earlier. Like I don't, I don't hold to that so much. And so I wonder, I mean, I see its usefulness in some context of talking about being in my head versus being in my body. Um, I wonder though, like about if reason isn't something that necessarily doesn't involve that dichotomy. Like it's, uh, it's necessarily beyond this mind body distinction and actually just a sort of a unity in some way of mind and body engaged with also world outside. Um, which is often also in this distinction not included as a thing that's it's affecting everything that's happening all the time <laughs> so you you brought up two things you're wondering about um the first was um the idea that that you know that the the, the this dialogical aspect to reason might be an, a, a necessary condition or at least a central condition of it and then you shifted um, and I'm not quite clear on what the shift was, uh, but you shifted to, you wanted to challenge the mind-body dichotomy uh, because you think it's much more about the unity of mind and body and then the unity of mind and body with the world. Mm, yeah. Yeah. And I think, I guess they, they could appear as just two separate topics, but I think where they kind of overlap 
is something in this, this requirement of others um, brings into play at least this aspect of world. Mm. And then the mind body um, distinction, um, in some ways, I don't, I don't really fully think I'm engaging in reason with others if, we're, if we can make that distinction. If we're sort of saying we're in our heads or we're, we're in our bodies, like actually I need to be in unity and have them be in unity or the more, as much as we can maximize a sort of unity of experience, then we're really able to reason together. So I, I'm not sure about that, but it's kind of an intuition that I have. Right. So I hear you saying, although there's uncertainty about it, but you, it's, the, it's at least striking you as worthy of consideration that if reason is inherently dialogical, then the others and the world are an inherent part of it. And that distinction isn't there. And then when I'm interacting with others, I'm not act interacting with mind or bodies. I'm interacting with in embodied minds. Um, and so that distinction doesn't really arise. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think that's right. I feel fully good. Thanks, John. <laughs> um, so I'll choose Cheryl. Um, so the first thing that's coming up for me is, um, uh, I, I just feel almost Socratically overwhelmed uh, because this is this is just amazing, um, and I I just wanted to first of all say that um, I find trying to um, stay in concert with everything is challenging, but in a way I really enjoy. So there is this feeling of overwhelm and perhaps some wonder as well with how expansive this conversation has been. Um, and there's a quality of it that's also, uh, I mean, it seems like that's the tension. It's both overwhelming and also wonder wonderful. I feel heard. Yeah, and that tension within me seems to resonate with a kind of creative tension between us. Um, so the tension within me between the making clear connections and, and opening right to so much more seems to resonate with the connection I have of trying to make clear connections to all of you, but also like, like really receive all the different things you're saying that are, uh, that I had not thought of. Um, and so the tension within and the tension without seem to resonate with each other in a very, very almost musical fashion. Hmm. Yeah, so I'm I'm hearing that there is there is um this quality of many different, I guess like melodies that are being played at the same time and we're in this resonance chamber right now where you want to you want to be able to listen to all of it and hold it all and at the same time hear the song that's kind of being played in the unity of it that's well that's well said yes um and so we've all mentioned this before in certain ways the, the this aesthetic it's not quite the right word i feel that's insufficient because what the words become today but there's this aesthetic quality to right uh, that's appreciation of beauty in in this like this this like like the way like i said there's the way clarity of connection and openness to what everyone else is saying and then the way i'm trying to connect to each one of you and also to all of us together, like all of those things are playing off against each other and reinforcing each other. Yeah, so it seems like there's almost multiple, I, I want to say scales, but maybe that's not quite it, mm -hmm. but multiple um, planes of attention that are simultaneously happening right now where it moves from kind of like the connection to each of us and almost like perhaps even wanting that individual personal connection and then also whatever is harmonizing between all of us. Yes. It, it, I mean, if I, I guess I'm trying to, if I was trying to simplify it, 
the way I'm connecting to each and all of you is informing uh, and, and, and in conversation with how I'm trying to connect to each and all of the ideas. Those two are playing off against each other and each is correcting the other. So it seems like there's there there's us as individuals and people kind of in this space, but then there's also all of the different ideas and concepts that we're also drawing in to the space together. So how so the work that you're doing right now is being able to feel into all of that. Yes, but also like the way the connections between ideas and the connections between people are like, <clears throat> like I, I like what you said about different scales, almost like they're in harmony uh, with each other in a dynamic way. Um, because mm -hmm. I don't know where the ideas are gonna go because I don't know where all of you are gonna go, but, it, but, I'll, but at the same time, as soon as you say something, I feel the continuity. I feel the continuity. It, it doesn't feel like, why is she saying that? Or why is Edwin saying that? Or why is Nathan saying that, right? Yeah, so there's this way in which you're following the kind of harmony that is happening simultaneously at many different scales. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, and it has a life of its own. Uh, that's what I mean. And there's something beautiful about that life. Um, that um, I don't know what to say. I just appreciate it. It, it. And it's and it's not separate from. It's not the same, but it's not separate from how I'm appreciating each one of you. Um, it's it's not the same, but it's not it's not it's not separate from it. Like I'm appreciating the life of the logos but I'm also appreciating each one of you, and, right? It's hard, that's hard to, to say clearly. There's, um, there's a sense of something alive that's between all of us right now. And And this is this is perhaps like a bit of an interpretation of what you're describing, but it it seems like there is um, a sense of yeah, I guess like care, a lot of care with whatever is alive that we're sensing. That that's helpful. So the final thing I would say is yeah, the the caring for. The, the, the dialogue and the caring for each one of you are not the same, but they're not separate. They're somehow bonded together. And I feel hurt. Speak to Edwin. Mm -hmm. Listening. Yeah, I, I want to come back to what's in my body. I notice actually there's, um, I don't know what it is. I'm, I'm a little bit nervous even putting words to what it feels like, but I, I'll describe it. There's, it's, it's like, it's not unlike nervousness, um, that kind of like fluttering heart rate um, and this like feeling of vibration, I guess, kind of like thrumming in my body. And then there's also some, so I think there's like that feeling of almost potential building. And I notice like perhaps the place that I, I would call reason 
is feeling also a little bit of like frustration and contraction around it's like how can I be precise about this how can I be precise about how to offer this to everyone so that it can be a contribution that is part of the coherence and part of the clarifying. Okay, so what I'm hearing is you're wanting to connect back to your body and you're sensing into that and you're feeling sort of here uh, like a fluttering, not quite a nervousness and you'd like to be able to uh, share that. And there's another part which you would call the reasoning is like maybe feeling uh, like wanting to be precise and accurate to, to be able to contribute that and maybe some concern, little anxiety there about uh, being able to do that. Yeah, I feel heard. And it does feel like um, a kind of tension that feels creative in nature, like if there is a willingness that I bring towards staying with that, with that desire, I guess, to be able to name and pin down and I guess like almost like model um, with also this other capacity, I guess, that's that is very much feeling a lot more. It is a lot, it is um, sensing with other qualities that feel, that, uh, that elude, I guess like for now is eluding that pinning, that desire to pin down. But I know that it's like the longer I can be with both simultaneously, um, there is this kind of, it's like a radial quality. There's like this like feeling of eventually that tension can actually expand and somehow the two capacities that I even falsely kind of distinguish as a binary right now are actually one and the same. So there's that, those two qualities that, that fluttery and then the wanting to be precise and that uh, it's like you want to just stay present with that awareness, not like go off somewhere else, but just stay present with that. Because if you just, you have like maybe trust that if you stay present with it, that some creativity will come out, out of that. And you're sort of describing it as a, I think a cylinder or something. You had some sort of description of it that and it's maybe not even two separate things, but maybe there is a wholeness uh, to it too. That's interesting when you um, describe cylinder, um, pro like the shape of it kind of felt much more spherical. It's like mm -hmm. maybe if I'm describing different poles, if there is this way in which, depending on how I can kind of pull out and lean into and almost expand into that tension, then there is this then it, it's like the separation begins to melt. Um, and something, as I'm speaking this out loud, I notice like there is more of that connection to, um, I guess, being able to <laughs> linguistically reify it, which is, I think something that I have been struggling with is like, it's like, I almost want to ask, I want to ask the question, what is the difference or how, like when we talk about what does reason feel like, there's this other niggling feeling, which is like, what does intuition feel like? And when Nathan was talking about the kind of mind body separation, I had this kind of moment of flash of, there's also this like reason intuition kind of separation mm -hmm. that seems to be also, um, yeah, present. Yeah, that's a ton. But yeah, so I was hearing that when I mentioned cylinder, it was actually more like a sphere. And it was like, there was like these poles to it. And then as you sort of sense into that more the, the question of uh, 
um, what was it, inspiration, I suppose the term that came up, the intuition or that, came, yeah. that, that, that sense of intuition and the, what does, you know, intuition feel like and sort of a sensing into that uh, quality of intuition. Is that close mm -hmm. enough? Feel heard yeah. enough? Okay. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Then, um, so uh, Nathan, can I speak to you? Yeah, I, I'm still, in terms of what John is saying, there's all these different levels going on of sort of awareness. And, the, you know, like, how do you sort of navigate that? And it's interesting, there's always something that has sort of salience. It's like, oh, this is really the thing to, to talk about. Because, and why? Because it has the most energy. It has the most feel. It's like, it kind of like wants to be heard, you know, or it's something that's just I'm kind of, it's, I'm sitting with. So that, that's how, so I'm just kind of going like, hmm, what's really so sort of the most salient uh, with me at the moment? I hear how you're... Um experiencing this conversation is that sort of tracking what's standing out what's almost announcing itself to you and it seems like uh it want you want it wants to be like spoken into the space yeah, and i feel like i'm still standing on that cliff <laughs> with you right looking into the abyss or so i really have that sort of that metaphor in myself is like looking into the abyss and it's almost like looking into my body to see what will arise like i don't know what's going to arise like just something comes seems to come out of that black abyss that's it's like i don't know where it came from it just kind of ar arose so what i hear you saying is sort of out of a, a nothingness that feels like it's kind of in front of you certain things just appear and come out come through in a way almost i mean you're not really sure how that's happening and, and sometimes i want i want to speak to what is arising you know from that from that abyss or that, you know, and I, I sort of like sit and wait for something to arise. You know, it's sort of like fishing, right? You <laughs> fish, it's like, am I going to catch something? You just have to, sometimes you just have to wait. And then I also feel some anxiety, like, uh, especially in a group, like something's got to come up, nothing's coming up, you know, and then some sort of anxiety about nothing sort of uh, arising. So what I hear you saying is a kind of like, tension between the desire to just let those things emerge authentically and then a kind of like feeling of being on or like needing to say something and an anxiety that accompanies not not wanting to like break out of this authentic rising but also wanting to be able to contribute when it's your turn and it, it makes me wonder if there's a like a subconscious reason, if the body, like without our conscious mind is reasoning, if there's a, a reason that the subconsciousness is doing sort of without even awareness, there's this uh, form of reason that does seem to be going on without even thinking uh, uh, about it. Uh, yeah, I mean, without consciously thinking about it. Yeah, so I hear you saying like there's, an, um, a question around if there's like an almost uh, yeah, non-reflected form of reasoning that's like taking place as a default kind of all the time and that you're just kind of you can observe and watch as it unfolds and and when uh when so these uh ideas sort of merge and i also have a feeling of wanting sort of that sense of authenticity sort of the honesty of just speaking to what is arising uh in the moment and and so be have a sense of honesty or authenticity to it because it actually feels good that it feels good to honestly share. It just feels sort of enlightening. It feels, I feel lighter. I feel, I mean, there's anxiety in there too. Like, oh my God, I'm sharing something. I'm feeling anxious about how it's going to be taken. Uh, yeah, so there's kind of those two things going on. Yeah, what I hear is that there's a kind of uh, a bit of, anxiety around the vulnerability of trying to be authentic and follow and like actually kind of care about this on authentic honesty and um and so in this way uh yeah maybe reasoning we're gonna say with authentic honesty like just caring about that and trying to bring it forward and an anxiety around the vulnerability of doing that off the cuff and not planning what you're saying and how it feels good to be able to share something authentically it's like it feels it feels like the experience has a, a 
a gentleness to it. It has a, it, it does not feel constricted. It feels sort of opening and re relaxing and connecting and warm and sort of loving, I guess. Mm -hmm. I hear you saying is speaking from this place of authenticity and honesty, it like facilitates and affords a kind of connection and a, and a, and a good feeling of sort of opening um, to the group and just generally feels like less constricted. And in a group, when I would uh, kind of look into that space to see what arose and nothing came up, I start feeling anxious, like, oh, I'm feeling anxious about, you know, nothing coming up. Uh, it's like, uh, I'm here on the spot, everyone's looking at me and nothing's arising. I'm feeling really anxious. And I start getting like a deer in the headlights, like, oh, then I start freezing. <laughs> you no, know, that feeling, especially like in public speaking. But what I'm trying to do is like, actually step back and, and just describe the experience that I'm having. Like, oh, I'm feeling like a deer in the headlights. I'm feeling anxious and nothing's coming up. So I kind of like step back from that and have whatever's happening in the moment be sort of the, the real thing is a way of sort of addressing that is, yeah. yeah. So what I hear you saying is that like, there are certain expectations that arise with the role that you take on maybe as the speaker right now um, and that can cause some anxiety. And so in order to stay in touch with this thing that you really care about, which is sort of honest sharing, um, yeah. you're gonna take that as an object and talk about it um, in order to not just freeze as your mind is kind of wanting you to do, but actually like talk about the freeze as a way. Of exactly, yeah. Uh -huh. And whatever arises, just talk about whatever is arising in the moment. Yeah, mm -hmm. so. So yeah, it's like just staying in touch with that authentic like coming out of the void or coming out of the nothing what's coming up for me yeah feel fully heard thanks sure. oh I, I don't know how to pick people anymore so <laughs> i guess I'll, I'll pick john and uh yeah what's what's coming up for me is this sense of safety like the reason might actually I don't know if I would go so far as to say like necessitate or need, but is definitely supported by a sense of safety and trust. Um, so there's like kind of the trust in myself or like Edwin was saying, sort of trust that like whatever's coming up is worth talking about and I'll just share that and that's a way to connect. That's a kind of trust. Um, and there's another kind of trust of like trusting that you're in this sort of empathy circle way, you're, you're actually trying to hear what I'm talking about. And both of these things seem to me to support my, my own ability to, to reason to be in that space of inquiry together. So I'm hearing you say there's reason might require a safety framing and that involves sort of trust, two kinds of trust, um, a trust in yourself, a trust that something will come up that will be relevant um, in some way, um, but also a trust that we're all committed to trying to hear what you're saying as best we can. Yeah, I think that's right. And, and then there's this really interesting element of that sometimes saying something that might not feel very safe <laughs> um, is essential, but it ultimately needs to be grounded in a larger sense of safety. So I might say something that uh, I'm worried about saying, but I can say it because I trust that, uh, I trust where it's coming from in me and I can trust that how, it, how it's likely to be heard. And that kind of assessment seems to support a lot, uh, this press, a form of presence and form of reason. So what I hear you saying is that another part of reason is the ability to say things that you might be worried about, uh, but you only feel able to do that if that's set within a, long, a larger context of, uh, of trust and that people um, are going to really connect with what you're saying. Yeah. And I guess that, I mean, what comes up for me is like that it could even be that or it could be that like in this sense, friendship is the best container for reason. 
in that like in a moment, I may not actually even have the connection and may not be able to hear me, but I can trust that we will come back and that over time we will endeavor to understand each other, even if it doesn't happen immediately. So there's a kind of deep trust over time that's like the best uh, affordance for, or like container for a kind of reasoning. And that's what it seems like to me. So what I hear you saying is, um, you're understanding deep trust as related to friendship, uh, where there's a commitment over time to constantly returning back to that connection um, and a commitment to returning back again and again to that connection. Yeah. Yeah. I think I feel fully heard. Thanks, John. Uh, so, Edwin? Mm -hmm. This thing? So I was uh, I was both I was impressed by uh, what uh, you said about um, there's a part of this process is where you're sort of you're just opening up to whatever's going to present itself as salient to you um, and for me that was uh, that was particularly uh, um, I don't know what to say triggering is the wrong word because that means it sounds like I don't like it but it was it was it was particularly engaging because um, that phenomena of the mind is one I've devoted myself to studying uh, for uh, like the four decades of my professional <laughs> career <laughs> so um, I'm deeply appreciative of uh, of that coming up so you're deeply appreciative of what I was saying about the, seeing what arises in, in awareness. And there was something, it wasn't quite triggering, but just appreciative uh, of, yeah. of that because studying it for four decades. Exactly. And then you, you brought up a kind of trust in that. And what I was, uh, what I was hearing you say, uh, um, although I don't know if you were intending to say it, is one of the measures of uh, uh, authenticity is, is exactly that, that, that kind of trusting. And then that made me think about the weird paradox we're in and why that trust is needed, because we're actually embodying the very thing we're trying to articulate. And so, right, we're, fee we're in two senses, we're feeling our way, we're feeling our way into it. And, uh, and that for me, that connected to everything Nathan was saying about how central that kind of trust is. Mm. So we're, we're feeling our way into this and it takes trust to do it, which is what Nathan is talking, was mentioned. Yes, very much. And now what's coming to the fore is, yeah, we have to trust that process of relevance realization because mm. we, can't, we can't get outside of it. There's no place we oh, can stand uh -huh. outside of it. And so we're in, we're within it, and what I'm, uh, I find there's a, I'm, I'm tasting a something like a paradox, because um, we are relying on it as we're trying to figure it out, and so we're kind of we're, we're doing this weird, we're doing this weird thing, um, not bad weird, good weird. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's, uh, oh, we we are trusting that process we're we're in it we can't get out of it we're we're stuck in the body and the and the and the rev but there's a there's a paradox that we're trying to examine it itself too yes yes we're trying to examine that and there's sort of a paradox we're trying to get we're trying to get outside of it in a sense to see it we can't can't get outside of it exactly exactly and uh, and i'm wondering if that tension is part of the other tensions we've been talking about, um, mm -hmm. right? That we've been mm -hmm. talking about. Um, that we've got these tensions we're talking about, and but there seems to be, for me, it, it, I don't know if this is right, but I'm, I got this sense of this being a deeper, uh, a deeper tension that might be uh, powering the other tensions. Oh, uh, so almost that that sense of trying to be trying to be outside of what we are seeing it from the outside is just a is it is a tension and that tension is sort of relating to a lot of the of the other tensions maybe it's maybe it's the an essence of tension is trying to be outside of what it is you're trying to to uh, examine yeah that's well heard uh, I, like i feel like there's these two moves we want to be in it and we want to be outside of it um at the same time um and for me, 
And that points to something that I also find paradoxical about reason. And this, is, this has actually helped me give a real felt sense to it, which is reason seems to have this capacity for self-transcendence that seems to be exactly that paradox. Uh, I, I get outside, but I find myself within, like Cheryl said. I, I, I've revealed mm. it, but it's always been there, right? There's this, there's these, there's this, this kind of. I'm, I'm gesturing because I can't uh, articulate the word. But the paradox, that paradox of in and out, and the paradox of self transcendence are really speaking to me right now. They're speaking to each other in my mind. Mm, so that sense of being in it and out of it, and that transcending of of the being in it is really speaking uh, to you. I think there's more in it that, that I'm not getting, but. Well, what I, what I was, yes, but what I, I guess the more in it that, that I didn't articulate very well was for me that 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 self transcendence seems to be in just an important feature of reason itself. Mm, so on one mm -hmm. one hand, oh, I'm bumping wow. up, one hand I'm bumping up against a paradox, but on the other hand, it feels like that paradox is essential to good reasoning. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of like the essence of reasoning is that transcendence of the current state that you're yes. in. And it's, it's also a paradox, but it's central to the whole process of reasoning, constantly stepping out of the state yeah. that you're, you're in is maybe even reason is the stepping out of the state that you're, that you're in. That's good. You heard me now, but what I want to say in addition then is it's, it's, it's the stepping out and then being drawn back in and the stepping out and being drawn back oh, in. Uh -huh. That's what I would want to add to it at this point. So reason is the stepping out of it and then the being drawn, pulled back in to the, yeah. it's sort of the detaching and then the reintegration or moving back into the, the state. Yes, you've heard me well. And that made me think again of what you were saying. I get drawn, you and I, we get drawn back in by the salient that emerges, but then you step back and you stop, you talked about your attitude towards it. And then you were drawn back into it in, in authenticity. Like I really heard that. I'm only seeing this now, but this is reflectively, but I really heard that in what you were doing. Uh, so you were seeing it embodied in me, kind of stepping yeah. out of, of the state and then being drawn back into the authenticity part of it. So you're seeing it sort of modeled or you're able to. Yeah, which is exactly, I guess, my point. We're, 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 we're speaking it as we're modeling it and we're modeling it as we're speaking it. And those two are, are playing off against each other really powerfully. And, and for me, um, I, I'm really just appreciative of being here because for me, that's the, the essence of the Socratic endeavor to get that where we're embodying it and reflecting on it and embodying it and reflecting on it. Uh, and, and, and that I'm finding that this particularly tasty, almost juicy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it feels really juicy, the Socratic <laughs> method of, of being in it, you know, stepping out of it yeah. and then moving into it. So just that back and forth flow is like the essence of the Socratic uh, process. And I think that's the time to thank you. Um, speak to Cheryl. Here. Yeah, that, that stepping out it's sort of like stepping out of a state and then being able to name it. And then you're in the state again of naming things or of being in it, it, it that whole dynamic. It, it, uh, that, yeah, that's something I've been trying to grow in. Like, how, how do I get better at, yeah, I used to kind of like stay in the state of, of something and not being able to step out of it to see it. And so I've, I've been trying to figure out how to get better at that i'm hearing that you see that as a capacity that you're working on this ability to step out and then come back in and then step back out and then come back in as this almost oscillatory pattern yeah and and i don't even know if it's if it's a stepping uh, stepping back in it's kind of like it's a constant stepping out so it, it's or back, or it, it, maybe it's not being back in, but maybe uh, he, here's one state, I'm stepping out into it, sharing another state and another state and another state. And so there's like this flow of, of different feelings that are, are, are arising. Mm. So there's um, a quality of expanding as well. You're going, you're kind of going, you're stepping further and further. Yeah. It's like I can, 
I can step out and then I can describe what the stepping out feels like. The stepping out feels like uh, it, for, for me being in a state, it has a, a darkness, a, a warmness, uh, sort of if it looks, it's kind of black, there's a blackness to it. And when I step out, it feels a bit more sort of rigid. It feels white and sort of has a rigidity to it is what I, what I sense. But by describing the rigidity, I'm kind of like stepping back from that and I'm still in the state. So <laughs> getting complicated. <laughs> yeah, it feels like um, when you're in it, it's quite dark and you're feeling it a lot more. It's almost like you're surrounded. It is your environment. And then when you step out, you're able to see it from the outside. And there's something that feels more concrete all of a sudden. I'm more not, solid. It's not more solid. It just I'm just describing the quality of it that it, it's more white in terms of oh, felt yeah. experience. It feels or senses white and it feels a little sort of jaggedy, has a little jaggedy uh, quality uh, to it. Mm. So when you step out, it's more it's whiter, it's more illuminated. And then you're also able to see the texture of it better. Yeah. Or the texture is sort of jagged. It has a jaggedy feel yeah. to it. Yeah. So the, so it has, um, the texture is jagged. The texture has edges. Yeah. Um, that reminds me, I, I did a sort of a freestyle dance. Uh, you know, I do freestyle dancing. And in the dance, I was sensing, a, I had a sense of anxiety in, in myself. And usually I said, oh, I'll go do something else. I said, no, I don't want to leave, you know, just ignore or, you know, go do something, you know, detached. I want to go into the anxiety. I want to, I wanted to sort of fill my whole awareness. And I want to see the pixels of it, just like you move into a photograph and you see the pixels of the photograph. And I started doing that saying, oh, I'm feeling anxious. I'm moving into it. How do I kind of increase it? You know, breathe, oh, if I breathe into it, it'll get bigger. You know, the anxiety will get bigger. It's like starts filling more parts of, of my body. And, and as I move and, and then I say, okay, I wanna get closer to it. And I could sort of feel like little knives, you know, cutting away it, it, in, in me. It's like, oh, let's get into the, into the knives. And the more I moved into it, yeah, I got in bigger and it came a point where it sort of just melted away. It's like, hey, it's gone. That feeling is, is gone. And uh, so that's just, that's like another sort of process description. Mm. And so you're describing this other process where the movement is going in closer towards the, the feeling that you kind of raise as an example is anxiety and then feeling it build and grow more and more until it fills everything. And then it grows to the point where then it dissolves. Yeah, it was like the sensing into the pixels of it. And I did that for like an hour because as soon as that one was gone, there was another one, another anxiety that I was aware of. And it was sort of in my head and it was like, oh, it's, this is like cloud, it's like a fog, it's like a heaviness. So I said, okay, I'm gonna go check that one, <laughs> check that one out, you know? So I kind of went into it and eventually that, that kind of dissipated. And so for an hour it was going, just searching for different fears and anxieties and going into them and through them. And it was like, just this one of those sort of peak experiences, you know, just the experience of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um you're describing experiences of just, you had this movement of almost swimming closer and going deeper into these different um, felt states. Of and then fear and anxiety, yeah. Fear of anxiety. And then noticing um, that quality of it, like kind of growing and expanding and then again, dissipating. Mm -hmm, exactly, yeah. So I feel for that's my time, so yep. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll speak to Nathan. Yeah, I, I'm definitely feeling the juiciness of the conversation right now. And something that was coming up to me was um, that paradox 
that the paradox, which is the tension that I can very much feel, I think is in the uh, provocation of what does reason feel like? And there's something about that question of asking what reason feels like that almost brings like it's like it brings us so intimately to the tightest feedback loop of being in and out simultaneously because it's almost yeah like i think i have this there's this quality where i'm so i'm more aware of how reason is always trying to step out for me um so edwin when you're describing kind of like stepping out and seeing in but then feeling always brings me right into, um, for example, like the feeling of anxiety or into my body. So when I sense into the question, what does reason feel like? It drops the simultaneity of both being in and out into the same moment of mm -hmm. inquiry. So it's kind of, yeah. So I feel kind of like almost like tensely held in that liminal space between in and out and kind of feeling, I guess, the attractor on both sides. But here you're saying it's like that reason often feels like a, it involves this movement outwards of taking as an object and then feeling uh, is a kind of going inward for you. And then this, and taking reason as the subject a feeling, what, do I, what does reason feel like? This kind of like bringing these two things into a deep, uh, relationship with each other. You sort of seem like they almost collapse into one thing. Like, is that enough about that? Yeah. And I, it's, it's interesting. I, I, I feel like I'm on this membrane right now. That's both inside and outside. It's like skin where I can feel the inside of my skin and the outside of my skin at the same time. And it's a little bit, Discom it's like it's discomforting but also delicious like there's yeah it's like feeling feeling both directions simultaneously um of that skin and membrane and i do yeah i i wonder about what i guess like it's like what happens when i am able to I don't know why there, I have this sense of it's like the closer I can tighten, I guess, like the, the feedback loop between in and out, the more I am able to then relax. Yeah. It's like, even as I'm saying the word relax, there's this, oh, that's, it's okay. <laughs> It's mm -hmm. like, yeah, it's there, it's here. What I hear you saying it's like there's often this sort of separation between the reflecting on and the feeling into, and the closer you can get this to a real time sort of informing each other, um, you can sort of relax into something, relax into what's here. I'm not sure what you relax. I don't know if I understood exactly what you're relaxing into. Yeah, I'm trying to notice what happened in the moment of relaxation. And it was, it was like the, it's like the, the outside that was seeking, that was almost resisting being so close to the feeling because it wanted to step away. And the inside that also has this quality of sucking you in, like, it's like, like the way anxiety was described by Edwin, it's like, it can kind of, the, the more you pay attention to it, the more it kind of grows. So it's like, am I able to just relax from both of those impulses, I guess? <sighs> so what I hear you saying is kind of, the relaxing is a relaxing from taking either the, the sort of desire to step back or the pull from the uh, from what's going on in the feeling world and what you're experiencing on that level. 
and relaxing his ability. It seems like it's coming from the ability to just stop uh, pulling and pushing in some way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the image that's coming up is, it is like a light and dark, almost like a yin yang, but it's like, if reason is like light and top and like above and feeling is below and darker, it's like there are kind of forces where I want to kind of get pulled up higher or I want to get pulled in deeper. And what does it feel like to then kind of meet, just be intent? It's like, it's so interesting. It's almost like it's both like relaxing and intensifying towards the center. So yeah, when you're describing this sort of meeting point of these two forces that can get like closer and closer to where you can hold them both at the same time. And that's kind of affording this relaxation. I'm not quite sure that I understood you. So if I didn't there, <laughs> please help me. I'll, I'll stop here. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I hope that I did at least a, a passable job there. <laughs> um, I, I feel like I've been from the, from the pattern of the thing I've been picking John. So now I'll pick Edwin. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, what happens? Yeah, what comes to my mind is like kind of it's 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 moving away a bit from the the binary of stepping in and out, but it, it includes it somehow. I'm just like what's my mind is sort of going toward practices that I have that seem to afford something like that. And so I guess it includes it, but it it's interesting to me that like there's a way in which I could use that stepping back and going in to describe something that's happening for me in meditation. Um, also something's happening for me in bouldering, like climbing, uh, which I do a lot. And also uh, in music, where I like, especially writing music, um, where I feel like there's a kind of like capturing, you know, oh, I, this, this is the line, ah, this is the line. But then I am also in this, engaged in this process of like listening, it's like, no, that's not quite it. What is it? What is it? What is it? What is it? And sort of like, sensing into and then capturing again like oh that's it that's it that's it and sort of like flowing here um with climbing like sort of trying something and then stepping back out and saying like okay that didn't work like what is it and sensing into with my body or with meditation more just sensing into with my felt sense like oh i, I got off the breath and I'm back what is what's going on with the breath what is it what's here so you're uh looking at uh, applying this to different practices, climbing, uh, meditation, uh, and uh, writing, where you try something, you, and then you step back and sort of evaluate it, and then try something else, and then move back, and always trying to get to sort of a, maybe a perfection, or a, some, getting to some state. Uh, yeah, I think that state is like, something. yeah, it's like, it, sound, it seems to me what Cheryl's kind of pointing to with this the state where the feedback loop is so tight that it feels like it's just happening right now. Like this is sort of the, they get in a flow state. And basically if I can get into a flow where I am both sort of like listening to what's out there and, and open to what's coming at me, but also sort of like holding on to a, a real sense of what, I, what it is to me right now at the same time, like sort of open holding in a way, like as though I could hold something with my open hand. So there's a state of being open to what's arising as well as a, a holding of, of something and just being in that constant state of being open to it and, and to the holding at the same time. Yeah, yeah. And I feel that this is kind of what seems to be missing in this, at least for me, in the contracted sense of not being able to reason my body is that I can't, I'm, I'm holding, I'm kind of gripping in the same, same metaphor. I'm like, my hand isn't, is clutched around the thing and not open. Um, so I mm. can't, in that sense, from my, from my analysis of it, it feels like I'm not reasoning in this 
clinching, but I'm reasoning in this opening. Mm -hmm. So the reasoning takes place in, in the opening, but not in the clinching. Like reason is like inhibited in the clinching and it flows in, in the, that opening, that feeling of open, openness, opening. Yeah, and I guess one last thing I'll say is that I'm curious about if that's always true. Um, like when it might be actually quite productive to introduce the tensions of, of clinging um, mm -hmm. and kind of, if there's a way in which, if I hold it in this larger frame of not actually doing that, <laughs> if I can have, for example, a debate in which I reason, um, and I'm, my, my role is to, to sort of beat the other argument and perspective, but at the same time, I'm actually engaging in good faith and want to know um, what's right. You didn't quite catch that within it, that, that there can be a debate where you're you're in the in a in a debate, but you are really honestly, openly trying to understand and, and know what's happening. Yeah, I guess what I'm pointing to is just a curiosity that came up in me around if it's possible to 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 use to to reason from a con, like a sort of what I was describing before as a more contracted state, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but actually in the name of a sort of greater openness, collapse around a certain view and argue for it very vehemently, but I'm actually, the process is reasoning more than maybe I myself am reasoning. I wonder, it's curiosity. Mm. Yeah, so it, it's about being in that constricted state uh, the, and can you have that constricted state, but also be reasoning, arguing for a point in an open way with, within, a certain, within a process. So kind yeah. of hold both of those states at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I guess in that sense, uh, the final thing that I'll say is something around the interest there in like, if, for example, the scientific method, when it's working properly, um, is a kind of collective reasoning in which no individual necessarily needs to be reasoning. Um, I'm just, it's kind of uh, an interesting thing to me to think about the feeling of the feel that, that I might not feel in my body at a moment that I'm reasoning, but I might be a part of a process that is, and kind of just bringing up like culture might in some sense be a collective reasoning that none of us are necessarily feel like we're mm -hmm. like just uh, actually, like we may actually have our own cultural expression, but collectively we're participating in a form of reasoning. Is it that you could be constricted in and of yourself? You're in this constricted state, but you're part of a culture that is reasoning. So you're sort of part of a, a reasoning process, even though you're feeling constricted and closed off. Yeah, I think that's right. Just this is a as a kind of qu open question that I have a curiosity. Mm -hmm. I wonder about that if I would count that or not. Yeah. yeah. So just sort of sitting with that question: is this uh, is this accurate? And yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Thanks. I feel free. Okay, great. Well, we have about 10 minutes. So I thought maybe we just open it up and just hear how was this uh, process, you know, the, the empathy circle, you know, the act, empathic listening, the question and so mm -hmm. forth. Just open it to any sort of uh, feedback. Step out of it. <laughs> Step out of the, and what is arising from the, from the void? <laughs> um, I thought this was really valuable. Um, I'm going to probably refer to this uh, video in, in other work that I do, uh, because it, uh, it definitely captures a really important piece of uh, both in the manner and in the matter. I mean, the way we were doing it, but also the way it was disclosing aspects of reasoning that don't typically come up when people just hear the word reason or just I'm being rational or being around like all of that it was very superficial compared to where we got to and yet where we got to is where I think people need to get to if they want to engage in uh, a Socratic dialogos so for me uh, not only did I find it intrinsically valuable in doing it and getting connected to all of you I just think that what this uh, this this video I think is going to be you know, like important hmm. Well, for me, it was like, uh, or it's still, I feel like I'm kind of caught in that moment, that rare kind of air where I, yeah, it seems like really sitting and in, in good faith, genuinely exploring and all of the things that everyone is opening up, the different aspects were like uh, affording me a kind of like 
shift in my perspective and uh, new spaces to consider. Um, and I really like that, yeah, just that aspect of not trying to, not trying to establish the truth um, as, a, as a thing, but at the same time coming into a shared resonance of the truth mm. um, as, we, as we listen to each other. Yeah, my, my reflection on my first ever empathy circle is I found the container to feel very safe, even though, like I know Nathan quite well, I've met John once and Edwin, I've never met you before. Considering the fact that there was um, something that felt I realized that there was, um, it felt safe to feel risky, I guess, because there was something about, it felt like reason, which often kind of desperately clutches onto its flashlight, just needed to relax in the darkness and just switch it off and Yeah, I, I find it's, it takes a lot of trust. And then within that kind of arena of trust to be able to allow, it's funny, now that I'm describing reason, it's like reason feels like almost like a character to me. Like she's, yeah, she is able to just relax into her environment, become porous, and then almost begin to sink into and expand into these deeper, wider, wiser capacities. Yeah, and it required a lot of just, as Nathan mentioned, not trying to seek truth, but letting it also come. So thank you. Mm, great. Well, for me, how is it? Uh... I feel sort of a little bit of constriction and almost a giddiness. It's like a giddiness <laughs> that I've got to kind of contain. It's like, I just want this, I could go for kind of hours, you know, uh, just kind of exploring this. And, you know, we went two hours quite a, quite a while, but I feel like I could go for, I, I had thought of doing a, a day long empathy circle. Can you go for eight hours? What would happen after eight oh. hours? <laughs> Take bathroom breaks and stuff, but so anyway. So yeah, well, great. Thanks for taking part uh, in this, and you know, glad to do any other uh, circles or maybe, maybe. I think this is a great topic, uh, you know, for bringing in other people too. So I hope we can continue. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to post it to your site, uh, John. Instead, I would very it. much like that. Edward. Yeah. If you would, if you if you mm -hmm. could send me the file, I'd very much like to to post it on my channel. I'd like like I'd like to be able to refer to it. No, that'd be great. Yeah, you got a much bigger audience, so it'd be great to get the word out. Yeah, if that's okay with you, I'd really oh, absolutely. That. Yeah, that'd yeah. be fantastic. So, okay, well, that's uh, kind of all I've got um, for now. Uh, so, thanks everyone for taking part in this, and to be continued, I hope. Yeah. Well, thank you, Edwin, for for creating this and bringing us together. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. It's been a, it's been a real I'm pleasure. Really Bye. <laughs> Bye. Yeah. And thank you, Nathan, and thank you, Cheryl. Yeah, thanks, John. Thank you all.